Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Is Asian Studies for Me? My name is Connie. Sophie and I will be your moderators today. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge that UBC Vancouver is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. On behalf of the Asian Studies Department hosting today's webinar presentation, I'd like to again welcome all of you for joining us today. I recognize that we have students coming from different backgrounds from UBC and also of UBC. So please feel free to comment in the text box telling us which faculty or prospective, prospective faculty you are in and which school you study in. We are so excited to see all of you and we hope today's webinar presentation will support your learning about the Asian Studies program at UBC. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to note a few housekeeping items. Today's, today's presentation will be in three parts. An introduction of our panel, a Q&A session with some questions that are most frequently asked during the hours we perform we collected from you. And lastly, we'll leave some time in the end to answer some of the questions you have. So feel free to submit any questions along the way and we'll come back to them near the end of the presentation. Please also note that today's presentation will be recorded. A full version of the PowerPoint slides will be shared to you. I will encourage you, but we encourage you to take notes along the way as it may take some time for us to send an email to you. Now I would like to warmly welcome our panelists, Christy Lin, Hasimaran Shakdeva, Aaron Stranis, and Aaron Wu. They are all senior UBC students with an academic focus on Asian studies. We will speak on their areas of expertise to you. Without further ado, let's turn it over to the panelists. Okay, so uh, thank you for having me. And hello, everyone. My name is Christy, and I am a fourth year student majoring in Asian studies and also minoring in ACAM, which is Asian, Canadian, and Asian Migration Studies. And my focus for Asian studies is around popular culture, so specifically film and entertainment in Korea, Japan, and China, as well as the historical and political relationships between those three countries and how that affects our society today. And in terms of why I chose Asian studies, um, I actually didn't choose this major until my third year. And I think I just had a tough time at UBC trying to decide what I really want to study and I was interested in you know like media studies, film, sociology, psychology, philosophy and just a lot of different topics and by choosing Asian studies I was able to kind of explore all these different interests of mine but also focus that within Asian culture and Asian regions and yeah I'm, I'm very happy to be graduating soon and hopefully after everything settles down with COVID-19 um, I'm hoping to travel to Korea and Japan and teach English in the future. And yeah, so thank you for having me. Hello, my name is Harsimran and um, I'm actually just, I just graduated with a bachelor's in South Asian languages and culture. And um, the, the region that I focused on in terms of my coursework as well as my external research opportunities have been West Central uh, South Asia, so specifically Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. I'm really interested in the politics of these regions as well as their history and, um, like Christy says, how, how it impacts, impacts our society today. Um, why I chose Asian studies, I had a similar experience. I came to UBC with a general idea that I wanted to study um, this region, but I wasn't sure how to do it. I was thinking a history major or perhaps international relations or political science. Eventually ended up choosing um, Asian studies because it gave me the opportunity to study these three or these um, these regions and uh, the other other majors I found were a bit more Eurocentric. Um, so I, I enjoyed being able to take coursework uh, that was in my particular age, uh, region of interest. Um, other than that, it's a pleasure to be here today and I look forward to this discussion. Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Thronis and I'm a recently, uh, like her Simran, recent graduate from UBC and I did a BA in Asian Area Studies. Um, I focused my regional expertise on late imperial China, so particularly the Ming Dynasty, um, and I studied geocultural statecraft of early Ming philosophers, uh, cartography, maritime military history, 
and also enjoyed contemporary Chinese history as well. And during my time at UBC, I had the opportunity to serve as a TA and an RA with various professors and in various faculties. And I will be pursuing an MA at UBC in the fall. And then like uh, the former panelists who have also spoken, my, the reason why I chose Asian area studies and particularly in Ch Chinese studies was because I came into UBC and I knew that I wanted to study China. And I had been studying Chinese language for about 11 years prior to coming to UBC and understood that history and culture were a perfect blend of uh, all of those disciplines. And Asian area studies allowed me to blend all of those disciplines together. And like Har Simmons said, I felt that perhaps a degree in history would be a little too Eurocentric. So Asian area studies, I felt, was for me. And um, I'm also a transfer student. So if any of you are like me, are, are planning to transfer or have already transferred and have questions, please feel free to ask. I'd be glad to help. Thank you very much for having me. And hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron, and it's a pleasure to be invited to be one of the panelists here today to speak about uh, my own experience. And uh, I am a third year political science major who's going, who is about to go into her for, like fourth year. However, I am only one here who is not majoring Asian studies. But I do have a lot of experience learning Asian language. Um, and I'm also taking a lot of Asian studies courses here at UBC. And why, um, as a political science student who, um, like, I take a lot of Asian studies courses is because uh, my focus is on Asian politics. And so learning the Japanese language as well as the history of t modern Japan and the relationship between Japan and China and Korea uh, helps me to uh, have a deeper understanding on the political side and on the social side uh, for my own personal studies. And uh, yeah, um, I also have a background of uh, learn. sorry, because, uh, uh, well, excuse me for a second because I just woke up. Like, it's because I'm not in Vancouver right now and uh, it's here pretty far away because I'm in Shanghai right now. So um, speaking about my own experience, why am, why am I taking Asian courses is because um, when I was in China, like a, maybe it's 10 years from now, uh, we had huge protests about um, Japan, Japan, China, and they have really, uh, they had conflicts. And uh, I was really interested in why um, all of this is happening. And uh, so that's why it turned me into the political science, uh, political science study and the Japanese studies. And I hope, hopefully my experience learning Japanese and learning about Japanese culture can help you a little bit today. Thank you. Thanks all our panelists for their amazing introduction. I believe now you get to know about them a bit more and what leads them to majoring in Asian studies or taking Asian studies courses. As you may wonder some specific questions, we have prepared three most frequently asked questions that we have collected from you in the RSVP form. Please note that not every question in the form will be addressed in today's session, but we'll try our best to answer them in the PowerPoint slides that we sent to you. And thank you again for your contribution to the questions and let's hear what our panelists have to say. The first questions we have is about course planning. So how did you manage your course planning in order to successfully major in Asian studies? And any advice would you give to students who are looking to major in Asian studies? Mm, so for planning ahead, I think my number one advice would just be to, um, oh yeah, sorry, so for planning ahead, yeah. So because Asian study classes are actually pretty small compared to your other courses that you might have in like math or psychology or science. So because the classes are smaller, like seats might fill up faster. And if you actually go and check out the Asian study courses, you might notice that a lot of them have wait lists or they have 
or they're blocked for your registration. So just planning ahead throughout like one or two years, um, just making a timeline of courses that you want to take would be very helpful. And I think this especially applies for the extra language requirement that you want to do because some languages, depending on which one you take, they like take up a different like amount of time. So some might be just one term, some might be two terms and take the entire year. So yeah, planning ahead would be my number one advice. Yeah, similar to what uh, Christy just said, um, research and planning is essential, but I think um, one needs to also be flexible. Personally, I kept an Excel file uh, with course requirements and would update it each semester so that I'd always be able to keep track of requirements on my own end. And then I met with my undergraduate advisor within uh, the Asian Studies Department at the beginning of every semester. And this would ensure that, again, I was on track to graduate and there were no um, surprises. Um, I, str I strategically chose electives that I thought would be useful to my career goals. Um, the departments that I took most of my electives in were history and political science. And then lastly, I would say really talk to your professors. There are always, uh, there are always opportunities to get more involved and learn. And so they're truly our most valuable resource. So I would definitely take advantage of that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I strongly agree with um, with Christine Harsimran's advice and would echo that. Um, on my own, I would say that th as you plan your degree, you know, as you progress through Asian studies, you want to maintain a balance between pursuing your personal interests as well as exercising long-term foresight. So you have a you know kind of a long-term goal in mind. You know, do you want to maintain a high GPA so that you can uh, get scholarships and awards? Or do you want to get into graduate school after you graduate from your BA? Or do you want to gain employment you know, immediately after uh, you complete your studies? So you want to choose the courses based on those long-term goals. And it's okay if you don't have those yet because you know, these long-term goals of what you want to do post-graduation take place gradually and take form gradually. So, uh, but be strategic and calculate it as much as you possibly can so that you don't end up wandering too far off the track, um, but at the same time that you stick, you know, you stick to broadening your experience and your expertise. And then I would also just suggest take summer courses too. Um, but I took summer courses throughout my years at UBC and it greatly accelerates your degree progression as well as lightens your workload in the long run. So um, there are Asian studies courses offered in the summer so I would really suggest that you take advantage of those. Uh, they are compressed, but the workload is uh, adjusted to compensate for the compressed format. I personally enjoyed it very much. The campus is gorgeous during that time of year. So, um, and, and it's still, you can still enjoy the summer too, right? So um, you know, don't hesitate to take summer courses. And be careful as well with your science credits as well. You want to be strategic. Uh, if I was personally terrible at science, so make sure that you do um, take courses that you understand that you will do well in if GPA or graduate school is something that uh, matters to you. I'd be happy to recommend professors and courses uh, for the science requirements because we have to do six credits of science uh, as an Asian area studies major. Um, so yeah, I'd be glad to help, but thank you very much. Thanks our panelists. I think one really good point they have mentioned is always planning ahead. As a graduated student myself, I realized that it's so important, especially when I enter my third and my fourth year. So yeah, highly recommend to plan ahead. Um, our next question we have is about learning Asian language. I think that's one of um, the one that many of you would be interested. And what are some of the challenges you have been through in learning an Asian language? And are there opportunities available outside of class to improve language fluency or learn about, learn more about the culture or country that you are interested? And so, um, indeed, it is always challenging to learn a brand new language. And when I first started to learn Japanese, um, the intonation and the pronunciation was very much difficult. And um, also, kanji makes a big part of Japanese language. Um, so for most of the English-speaking people or, or people who don't have an 
Asian background, um, it is hard for them to pick up the kanji part because it's hard to write, physically speaking. And um, also, to me, personally speaking, the, the, the sayings that involves a deeper understanding of the Japanese language uh, or the Japanese culture uh, is very much challenging. And because you are not only picking up the language, but also the, the, the history and the way people think is all backed up in the sayings, the ancient sayings. And so for people who are interested in learning the language, um, well, the, the pronunciation, the, the, the grammars, the, the intonations, they're they are very much difficult, but there are a bunch of tutorials online that's available uh, for people who are interested. And for opportunities that's outside of the class, um, we have a bunch of student circles at UBC that can help your friends uh, with, uh, with, with, with different people. With the, um, let's say um, if you're interested in Japanese, we have uh, JA, so Japanese Association, um, in Nest, uh, where you can just hang out with friends and um, chatting with Japanese students. And we have a Japanese Career Association, uh, JCA, um, for people who are interested in finding jobs in Japan, and they they can help you to learn the business Japanese language as well as the like Kago, but it's it's only like a higher level. And we have a language table every Friday. Uh, well, um, I'm not sure how this coronavirus is gonna impact on the language table next year, but definitely um, go check out the website. Uh, we do have language table every Friday. Um, um, so there, Nitsume uh, Kandaigaku, which is one of the um, universities, um, universities in Japan, which, where we have a partnership with. So they have uh, exchange students uh, from Japan. They come here to learn English, and uh, we have students here at UBC who's taking Japanese courses who love to learn more about Japanese. So they kind of uh, mush together and have like two hours good of talk. And we also have Taku Club, Kagaki Club for uh, Japanese reading and Japanese writing. Um, both of them are available for like uh, 100 and 200 levels. So feel free to check them out if you're about to go into the uh, Japanese courses here at UBC. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, for me, I'm, I'm Chinese Canadian. And so I Chinese was kind of like the language that I've been learning all through high school. But when I got to university, I picked to learn Korean. And I think one of the biggest challenges is just um, the courses are very intensive. But I think um, it's designed in a way that the classes will. So my class was from it was two terms. So it's designed in a way that like the students really get to know each other really well. And you also get to know the professors really well. And I really enjoyed that bit of it. So even though, you know, we had a weekly court like quizzes and just everything was very fast paced, the course itself was very enjoyable. And I also ended up going on exchange. Um, to Korea last summer and um, I actually went with some of my classmates from a Korean class so that kind of shows you like how close you kind of become with your classmates um, but yeah this is just some pictures from my experience there and I think um, you, I also have two videos about my experience and one of them is just like a quick day in a life of an exchange student in Korea and yeah that was really fun and in terms of opportunities outside of class um, I would definitely recommend Tandem. It's a UBC program, and I think Connie will go over that a little bit later. But yeah, just UBC, I mean, Tandem and Glow Global is, are both the kind of opportunities that I took advantage of in terms of growing the language and being able to practice that more outside of classroom situations. Yeah, um, so there are definitely challenges related to choosing unconventional or marginalized languages. So the languages that I, I studied during my time at UBC were Persian, Urdu, Punjabi, and Sanskrit to varying levels. And then the unconventional nature of these languages meant that it was sometimes challenging to find resources that I could, I could access. Um, 
Additionally, it can be sometimes difficult to justify language choices when asked about the usefulness in, in career trajectory. So I think going in, you need to be really sure about why you are choosing these courses. Um, that that at least helped me out when, when I had to um, explain my language choices. I knew exactly how it was going to function into my um, ultimate career goals. Um, opportunities, yes, there are lots and lots of opportunities outside of class to learn languages. So reiterating Aaron's point about uh, UBC student clubs that are associated with the language and region you're studying can really help to widen your social circle and provide you with opportunities to practice your language skills. And then similar to what Christy just mentioned, UBC Tandem, uh, which Connie will be talking about later, is great. I, I did that my second year, I believe. Um, I also had the opportunity to do research abroad. So I participated in the undergraduate re research forum between Punjabi University of Adela and UBC during reading break last year. And it was a week long trip to India where we were immersed in the culture and history of the region that I'm academically on. And it was, um, it was an extremely profound experience because getting to hear about the region uh, in the classroom and being able to interact um, with the actual with with the locals and the culture on a very personal level is is a completely different experience so i would highly recommend that and then um Lastly, professors in the department are truly amazing. Uh, I had some great professors as my mentors throughout my undergraduate experience and was able to um, strengthen my understanding of these regions and their languages. Uh, an example is I approached a professor of mine to supervise a directed studies so that I could study content that I was interested in. At the time, I really wanted to learn more about Urdu poetry and there was no class at UBC related to that. So um, my professor, agreed and I basically spent a semester absorbing Urdu poetry. So it's really important to cultivate a relationship with others because they're well positioned to guide and support your growth. Thank you. Thanks our panelists for providing such useful tips in Asian language. They all have mentioned the tandem program at UBC. I was wondering um, how many of you here have heard about it? Um, I started a poll um, if you are with me, please let me know if you have heard heard about it or not. Okay, I see some um, no here. Okay, most of the answers are uh, never heard about it, which means that it's a great opportunity for you to check this out. Tandem is a free program at UBC in which a student will pair with a partner so they will practice um, their each other's language together. And nearly um, 1,000 students each year apply for Tandem. So I think it's a great opportunity for you to reach out. I also believe that this last questions we have is the one that many of you are curious about, especially if you are already in major, if you're already majoring in Asian studies or looking to major in Asian studies. How has an Asian studies degree benefited your career or personal endeavors so far? Yeah, for sure. So um, this is a great question and one um, that I have a few points that I'd like to talk on. Um, so the first thing is that in the Asian studies department, you can actually serve as an undergrad TA. So that means, you know, you don't have to be a graduate student, MA or PhD to serve and gain academic work experience in the field, but you can actually serve as an undergrad TA. So you can build your academic work experience, um, expand your professional networks, and, um, and then add to your CV because you really want to, especially during your undergraduate years, add jobs and experience to your CV that, that will be beneficial for your future career. And as well, that demonstrates some really solid engagement uh, with some higher level uh, types of jobs. Um, I had the opportunity to serve as a TA for two classes, Chinese history classes, and they were fantastic experiences with Dr. Clayton Ashton. And uh, you get to work directly with the professors. You mark, um, you mark papers and exams, uh, help with student questions, and you really get to see what the other side um, of the classroom is like. And then also, uh, as far as personal benefits of an Asian Studies degree go, um, I found that the degree really blends very nicely 
history, language, and culture, these three elements together, and they conjunctively allow you to think more like a globally minded individual. So thinking um, and considering perspectives that go beyond simply Canada or North America or the West, but that include areas in the Asian region. And that will facilitate your sensitivity to intercultural communication and, um, and allow you to appreciate and understand the value and significance and the nuances of communicating with people from other cultures. And which will ultimately make you a very good candidate for jobs nowadays because we're in such an interconnected world that you want to, that employers are looking for people who are able to communicate with other cultures and who know other languages and who understand history and the culture practices that inform the languages and how people interact with each other. So I feel, you know, personally and academically, there's a lot you can benefit from an Asian studies degree. And these are only two points that I have. There's many, many more uh, that I'd be happy to share uh, through LinkedIn or otherwise, but um, these are two important ones. Yeah, um, same as Erin, um, I'm also uh, one of the TAs who's, uh, in, who's teaching uh, Japanese courses here at UBC, and I've been doing a TA job for like two years now, and uh, well, I'm not technically, I'm not an Asian study major, however, um, being involved in the Japanese education really helped me to um, have a deeper understanding of the Japanese language itself, because um, we do like simple drill sessions, and um, so we practice with the students one on one, and also help me to uh, improve my Japanese level, uh, my spoken Japanese. Um, speaking about that, and uh, set, uh, sitting in the classrooms, uh, involving in the classroom sessions with the professor, it helps me to 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 learn about the process of how like um, a language has taught to the students. And um, yeah, it reminds me of, lo of lo a lot of the basics that people tend to forget when they kind of learn the language, they know the language for too long. The basics, yeah, like the, they're the keys to build up the languages. And um, why am I taking Asian study courses here is um, I'm a poly major, but my focus is on Asian politics. Um, and I am a, I'm from China, but I kind of saw too much about the conflicts between China and Japanese government. So learning Japanese and learning the Japanese history, uh, the other side from the other side uh, helps me to learn about why these issues are still going on uh, nowadays still and also um i completely w agree with aaron that like you know um being a ta or having like this teaching experience can help uh, in the future and um, for job hunting and um well that's something about me personally speaking because i'm also interested in japanese literature learning the japanese literature and the japanese um, Japanese language courses helped me to um, just serve my personal interests. And um, yeah, so that's why I'm taking a lot of Asian studies courses, despite I'm a poly major. Yeah, thank you. Um, Asian studies has greatly benefited my own career and personal goals. Uh, so instead of having to choose between history, political science, and languages, Asian studies allowed me to integrate these very disciplines into my major. I was able to cross-register in courses from different departments and supplement them to my courses in Asian studies. This way I was able to self-design a more comprehensive approach to my particular interest area. This of course worked because I knew what region I wanted to study from day one. And then because of the versatility of this degree, I have gotten involved with some great projects. So similar to both my previous uh, um, panelists, I was also uh, a TA for um, an Asian studies course. It was related to performances of South Asia. Um, and again, this was, I can't um, talk about this point enough, but 
cultivating relationships with professors. It was through a relationship um, that I formed with a my mentor, one of my mentors here at UBC in the Asian Studies Department. That uh, he asked me if I would like to if I would like to be a TA. So I through this TA position, I was able to. Um, absorb the culture while gaining various transferable skills. I even had the opportunity to lead a couple of lectures. And then um, I worked as a student assistant at the Center for India and South Asia Research here at UBC, which again allowed me to just get to know a lot of the work that was being done in, in the field. Um, last year I was also among a small group of students that monitored the federal election of India at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. So this picture seeing is from that and through this I was given opportunities to learn from field experts about the modern politics and history of this region. I was privy to a debrief by the High Commissioner of Canada to Pakistan and really gain um, access to industry specific experience because of my background in Asian studies. Um, currently I'm also supporting a multi-language translation project to make uh, mail ballots less cumbersome for people who struggle with English as their first language. And um, I am heading off to DC next month to pursue a legal education that I hope will eventually lead me to being able to work for an organization like the United Nations um, to really be able to advocate for communities in, in these regions of the world. So that's why I really, I, I knew these were my goals kind of going in and that's why I was really able to um, tailor the languages and the courses that I took to for that outcome. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I just wanted to quickly add um, and reiterate the importance of connecting with the professors um, and how Asian studies, like Erin mentioned, a lot of the courses are kind of tied to history. Um, so for me, I um, actually got, um, I'm a video editor for St. John's College, and although we focus more on Chinese Canadian identities, I just want to also say that Asian studies, there's a, a lot of opportunities for students to get involved by doing other things like social media, um, being helping them film and doing graphic designing. So there's also a lot of like media related job opportunities available if you go on um, Asian studies, um, their website and look at if they ever have any postings for part times. Thanks to our panelists for sharing their amazing experience. I believe now you have a more cl a clear idea of what opportunities are out there um, as a major, as an Asian studies major student, or as a um, Asian studies, or as a student who take some Asian studies courses and becoming a TA afterwards. I noticed that there are um, two questions raised already. Um, by one by Sophie and one by Sunny, I think which means that we can now take to the next step, which um, is we will taking some of the questions you have and we are happy to answer them. So please feel free to submit any questions you have. Don't be shy. We will try our best to answer um, the questions um, about Asian studies courses or the undergrad degree or even um, um, global exchange, global, global exchange um, experience and any other questions about Asian studies. So the first questions we have from Sophie is um, what are the best study habits you have um, developed during your study experience as an Asian studies student? Um, I would love to speak to that. Um, for, so. As for Mandarin Chinese, uh, some of the study habits that I found most effective and useful are firstly rote memorization because it is one a particular trend in some language courses, not necessarily EBC, but in general to overlook characters. So, but the characters are very important. So you'll want to learn how to write, how to read. These involve a lot of rote memorization. You can use flashcards or uh, you can practice the strokes. Um, so, in essence, what that boils down to is a large time investment because you'll want to st continue studying this beyond your degree. You won't be able to learn everything just within four years. So you want to make sure that, you know, you have commitment and dedication, time investment. Um, and, you know, there are lots, lots of language schools or lots of uh, 
supposed specialists who will try to offer you dirty little secrets or you know these kind of uh, roundabout ways or secret ways of learning a language, but really nothing can beat time investment and commitment and practice. Uh, it's some, you know, they say that sometimes the simplest strategy is the best one, and in my case, it, that has been the best one. Thanks. Um, Christy, would you like to share some of your thoughts? Yeah, I just want to mention um, that. I can also... Sorry, Aaron. Oh. No, Erin, you can go oh, ahead. Yes, okay. please go ahead. <laughs> Erin, please go ahead. You can. Yeah. Oh, uh, I thought I thought like uh, I just had a moment of confusion. I, I yeah. Uh, if I can speak after Christy, if that's okay. Oh, it's okay. Or please go you ahead. want to go first? Yeah, you could go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead, so, sorry. Um, sorry for interviewing. Um, so. Mm -hmm. So speak about some tips for uh, Japanese uh, learners. Uh, the intonation is um, the most challenging part. Um, so for uh, some of the people who are interested in, like let's say animation or 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 like Japanese movies, I guess uh, one of the way to pick up the Japanese intonation is to get yourself really um, used get your ears in, used to the, the Japanese sounds, the intonation. Uh, or you can just, you know, uh, spend like, let's say 20 minutes, um, like uh, in a few days to uh, watch one episode of something that you're interested, like animation or, or dramas even, because um, they're really helpful. And also um, speak as much as possible, like practice Japanese, speaking Japanese with um, Japanese friends that you make. Um, for some of the people who are really interested in Japanese language, we have a Japanese speech contest, which you can participate every year at, U uh, at BC. Um, I guess uh, this year it already finished. So every year in late February, early March, we have a Japanese speech contest, which you can partic participate um, and it kind of um, encouraged you to 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 stuff a little bit harder, to um, speak in front of the public, and to practice your language skill as well as like you know you have to memorize all the stuff. But it's really helpful. Um, helps you to gain confidence in speaking. So yeah, I strongly suggest people to try that out. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Christy, and I can would add, you like to... mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and I think just like an extra tip that I kind of found is for anyone that's more um, like that, for anyone that you, likes using technology more, um, you can try and find different apps or um, games to like help you learn a language. And this isn't like specifically for like Asian languages, but I think in general, um, learning something new through like interacting with a game and using the interface with your fingers is also like a great way to learn. Thanks, um, Christy, Erin, and Erin for sharing your experience. Um, before I move on to the next questions, I would like to ask everyone, um, are you taking any Asian courses right now? Or um, have you taken any courses, um, Asian courses be before or you are looking to taking courses in the future? I see I see some yes. That's good. If you have any um, questions about recommended courses from the panelists, please feel free to ask them. As this is some of the questions I would have if I was trying to look for Asian courses. I don't know like which one to start. Okay, we see one no, <laughs> which is, I believe you want to take some courses after today's webinar. And next questions we have is from, is from Sunny. 
Uh, Sunny is a third year physics major student, but she has taken some major courses with grade A and some previous teaching experience. Um, she is interested in applying for an Asia TA, and she's wondering if it's possible for Asia department to select people who are not in Asia major. I think this question, um, Aaron, Aaron W, would you like to answer this question? Yes, because uh, I would be one of the example, because uh, I'm not an Asian study major, but yet I'm doing TA job here. So um, basically, you have to be qualified all the requirements and uh, physically speaking to the professor or with the like, you know, the people who are in charge of this uh, is really helpful. Um, or you can just go go to the Asian studies, the office, because um, they always have people there. You can ask them questions about uh, registration and, you know, how how TAs are selected for specific courses. Yeah. So it's not impossible. Yeah, and but if I could add... go and speak with those. Yeah. Yeah, if yeah. I could add to what Aaron, uh, what Aaron spoke to, um, one of the key, um, I, I'm not privy to the intra-departmental uh, discussions and everything, but I would recommend, you know, if you're, even though you're outside of Asian studies, but you have some experience with the courses and teaching experience, I would suggest that you talk to your professors. Um, talk to the professor that you're interested in working with and if they have a TA ship coming up, there's a there's the possibility that they will offer you that TA ship or um, they will lend a word of support for you. Because um, that's exactly what happened to me is I was very proactive in my learning in one course and then I was offered a TA ship uh, by that professor later. So um, I, I would say that it's probably less important about what your major is, but more important your engagement with the course and uh, and the skills that you can offer. So um, do do reach out to the professor to indicate that you're interested uh, in in that opportunity. Thanks, Aaron, for bringing that very good point. I think it's very important for you to um, reach out and be initiative. Um, if you would like the opportunity, um, it's always good to step up of your comfort zone and reach out to professor because they would be willing and thrilled to help you if you are a qualified candidate. Um, the next questions we have is from Dennis. Dennis asked um, the questions for Aaron, Aaron T. Um, he was wondering what course would you recommend for fulfilling math requirements? and he's also planning on transferring to UBC Asian Studies. Is there any tips or recommendations when applying, Aaron? That is a very good question. Um, so to address the first part in terms of math requirements, um, I don't believe that for an Asian Studies degree you have to do math specifically, but you have to take two approved courses within the Faculty of Science. Um, so if you're really good at math, you can take a math course. Uh, right, but um, I myself am horrible at math and uh, practically incompetent in the scientific discipline. So, um, but they do, the Earth and Ocean Sciences Division offers courses that are tailored to be fit for arts students. So, you know, they blend the two disciplines together in a way that is accommodating to students who are not as good with math and the equations. Um, I would say EOSC 116, I'll, dict I'll write this down into the chat. Um, EOSC 116, the Mesozoic Earth um, with Professor Stuart Sutherland. Um, and then I also took an online course during the summer, um, EOSC 310310 um, with Dr. Louise Longridge, and that is the Earth and the Solar System. So the key to succeeding in those courses is memorize, memorize, memorize. Put in the time. You have to put in an enormous amount of time to memorize those uh, those informations. And um, but if you put in the work, you can get an A plus, like absolutely for sure. So um, I was fortunate enough to get two A pluses in both. So 
uh, both of my science courses, so I'd recommend that. Um, as, as for trans to UBC Asian Studies, uh, tips on recommendations when applying. Um, get everything done as early as possible. So, you know, you, you don't want to wait until the last minute to submit, you know, transcripts or send in your application because it can be, it can be quite stressful, um, especially when last minute decisions are required uh, or the like. I myself, I actually decided to transfer at the last minute um, from a different university. So, I mean, I'm speaking out of experience that it's not a pleasant experience to, uh, to transfer at the last minute. So get your materials and everything prepared ahead of time. Um, when applying, I, I can't, just make sure your stuff is ready to go. Um, if you have already completed all of your coursework, then you know leave it be. But um, if you're still completing courses, make sure that you give it the best that you can because UBC does care about the GPA that you're bringing to the table. So because with Asian studies, um, you know, I don't, I don't believe they require any personal essays, but they do look at your GPA. That's the thing that they look at when they are looking to uh, admit you. So make sure that you, if you haven't finished all your coursework, put in your, put your best foot forward and, um, you know, get those grades as high as you possibly can. Um, that's what I would say. I mean, there's probably lots of uh, stuff that goes on intra-departmental at the admissions department, but that's what I did. That's what I did to successfully get admission. Thanks, Aaron. I think this next question from Brandon is also related to transfer credit. I think um, as I have done some research before this webinar and I can answer these questions. So if you are trying to um, see how your transfer credits works when you um, transfer to UBC, um, enrollment service will assess your academic records, records to determine how your credits will be transferred to UBC. And once you have this information, you can decide the major that you like to pursue. In this case, I believe it's Asian studies. So I think um, talking to enrollment service and have them assess your academic records. Um, and then I think you have a better idea of um, what you can do next. Does that solve this questions? Brandon? Connie, if I could add one thing to that. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, please. I, I believe there is a website called BC Transfer Guide. So, it, um, so if you're transferring from another institution, um, you can cross-reference the credits that you took at that institution with their degree equivalents at UBC. So you can determine which courses, yes, exa uh, exactly, uh, bctransferguide.ca. Um, so yeah, you can do a kind of a step-by-step -step, uh, type of deal and go through each of the courses you completed and then determine if they'll be transferable. Um, so some of them are, some of them aren't. It just depends if there's an equivalent to UBC. Some of my credits did not transfer over, but you know many did. So and keep in mind that you can only transfer a maximum of 60 credits. So or in other words, half of it, uh, half of a bachelor's degree, which is 120 credits. Thanks, Aaron, and I'm glad that this solved your problem, Brenda. Um, do we have any further questions from our students? We saw one question raised. Um, this is from Frederick, and the question is for everyone. Can you take a major in one language in Asian language and culture, and then take a minor in another language in Asian language and culture? Um, Harsima, would you like to start um, providing some thoughts on this question? Sure. Um, so I, this particular scenario did not apply to me. Um, I just had one major and what the reason I ended up having to take a few different languages was, um, so my initial dominant language, the one I wanted to focus on was uh, Persian. Um, but unfortunately there weren't at once I got to, I think after the 300 level, there weren't so many uh, more courses that I could take. Um, so what I did is I ended up supplementing it with Punjabi and um, Urdu. 
So um, I would imagine that you would be able to combine like a, a major and a minor in two different languages. You would just have to be careful about fulfilling both the requirements. And my guess is you wouldn't be able to apply one language course for for both of those things. That's 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 my best guess. But again, I think your best resource would be to speak to um, the undergraduate uh, student advisor in the Asian Studies Department. I think it's it might still be Shirley, uh, but I think she um, the, the the department would be the best bet to get that question answered. Thank you, Harsmarin. I think Christy um, Christy is also um, while she majors in Asian um, language and culture, she also have an, has a minor in ACAM. Christy, would you like to um, share your experience? Mm -hmm, yeah, so ACAM is a little different. It's just a different, um, so just Asian, Asian Canadian, um, like Chinese migration studies. But like speaking to that question, I do have friends who are like Asian studies um, majors, but then they chose to minor in a separate language that they didn't include in the Asian studies. So for Asian studies, you're required to do a second language on top of the, the your first la like or the language i used to get into ubc so then for my friends who did minor in another language that would be the, their third language erin would you share your experience as well erin erin it's honest hmm. um to be honest i'm not quite sure um what what the uh what the other panelists have noted it uh would seem feasible if you do a major perhaps in asian area studies and then do a minor in uh in asian language and culture you could perhaps blend two different languages um but as was mentioned uh before you'll want to be careful that uh, especially when it comes to degree requirements because when it comes to language um you know you will you run the risk of perhaps overlapping your um overlapping requirements and credits so um which might result in you spending more money and more time uh, fulfilling your degree requirements and taking courses than perhaps you need to um and then i noticed that you had a question here uh uh for the same language for literature and language requirements um usually not i don't think so um but they do offer like there are chinese literature courses that you can take at ubc um but i don't think you can use that course to fulfill two different um two different requirements um again i would advise that you get in touch with shirley wong who's the undergraduate advisor she's extremely knowledgeable um, and no, she knows practically the answer to everything. So I would recommend you get in touch with her because she'll be able to provide you with the full details and uh, with certainty. Thanks, um, Aaron, for sharing the tip and answer Brendan's questions. I hope this solves your questions. Um, we also have questions from Ryan. Ryan um, has a question about if um, do you can you take multiple languages for majoring in ancient studies, or can you focus on just one, such as studying Korean and Japanese? Christy, would you like to take this answer? Take this question. Yeah. So I, I think for me, I just focused on one. Like to to complete my Asian area studies, I just had to have one. Uh, language requirements. So I did Korean and like I mentioned before, it took me two years to complete that um, like a full Korean language program. So I would like I would say probably just focus on one. I'm not sure how it would work um, like with the department and credit wise if you choose to do two. Mm -hmm. I think um, Harsimaran also um, to try to focus on one or two language and do you want to share your experience as well, Chris Marin? Yeah, sure. So um, for me, it was actually a requirement. Um, when I chose the South Asian languages and culture stream, I was free to choose the first language, but then for anyone who chose any of the South Asian languages, so for example, um, Persian, Punjabi, Urdu, Hindi, um, if you chose any of these languages, you also had to take an additional six credits of Sanskrit. So that was a requirement for me. Um, 
And then, like I mentioned before, just to supplement the credits that I already had in Persian, I, I had to take credits in Punjabi and uh, uh, and Urdu just to get enough credits uh, because there weren't too many more Persian courses available to me. It worked out for me because uh, the script was similar, the language was similar, plus I have a background in um, Hindi and Punjabi, so it wasn't too difficult for me to be able to add on those languages where my like I was still able to focus um, more rigorously on Persian. Um, so yeah, I, I do think it's helpful, but if it's a requirement, um, you just want to, I, I, I guess, make sure that you're, you're probably not taking both of those courses, like two different language courses in the same semester. It can really be confusing. Thank you. Thank you, Christy and Hasmarin. To summarize their points, um, Ryan, I think it depends on the language that you want to study. If you want to study Korean and Japanese, I think, um, from my experience, um, this Asian studies student I know, they always focus on one of them. Or if you want to study Persian, um, as Hasmarin just mentioned, you need to fill up, you need to fulfill the requirement by the department, which is to take um, Hindi um, more courses, take more language rest, uh, rather than focus on one. So I think it depends on the language that you want to study. I hope, and I hope this solves your question and provided you some um, information that you're looking for. No worries. Um, do we have any other questions from... Um, Sophie has a question for everyone. In addition to her Simmerance plans for law school, is anyone else planning um, to pursue a graduate degree or going to grad school in the future? I know that Aaron has already, um, Aaron and Hasimuran is going to um, grad school in the fall. I was wondering if Christy and Aaron have any thoughts on that. Aaron, would you like to um, share your thoughts? Um, that's uh, Aaron T, me? Aaron T. Oh, Aaron W. Okay. Erin, are you with that? Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking about doing graduate school outside of UBC. Yes, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I... I yeah. Yes, so, yeah, um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about uh, going to graduate school not at UBC, but in one of the, um, the, the internet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was thinking about going to grad school in one of the Japanese universities. Ideally, I'm thinking about like, you know, Kyoto University or, or uh, Tokyo Daigaku, because they serve, they have really uh, nice uh, programs that's about uh, Japanese um, politics and uh, the, um, Japanese language, so yeah, I'm thinking about going to Japan and study there. Um, actually, I planned, I originally planned to go uh, uh, apply for like Go Global, but because of the COVID, like it, it, my my plan had to change. So yeah. Well. Thank you, Aaron. Christy. Pretty unfortunate, but yeah, Peter. that's mm -hmm. as far as I know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, Christy, would you share any of the thoughts mm -hmm. that you have for grad school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I don't really have any big plans yet. Um, I think in general, I am more of a media and like hands-on type of person. So I'm trying to decide what I want to do and if I want to do something creative after university. I feel like if I do go back to school, it will be for education because I really do enjoy teaching um, kids especially, and I also really want to teach in Korea and Japan, so um, we'll see. <laughs> Thank you. I know that sometimes um, it's always takes some time for you to plan ahead, to plan for grad, grad school as it's such a big decision. Me and myself, even though I have, I have just graduated this year, I 
was still thinking about if I should apply to grad school. And I think if I um, explore more and check out more opportunities out there, and then I think I may um, have a decision soon. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't. If you apply for grad school, it doesn't need to be right after your bachelor degree. It's always can be after two or three years. Thanks. Um, thanks for all of you for this amazing questions, and let's um, have one or two last questions before we end today's session. If you like, to, if you are typing the questions, you can l let us know by raising by using the raise hand button here. So we we are know we know that you are typing the questions. Okay, Frederick, sounds good. We will be um, taking your questions, and I think we can um, end the session um, for today. Please also um, know that we will be sending the PowerPoint slides to you with um, the questions we have collected from you in the form and the questions you have raised along the webinar. So please, um, if you have taken notes, that's great. And we will be sending the PowerPoint slides to you as well. And please feel free to reach out to our panelists that um, through Lincoln, if you have any further questions, they have just mentioned that Shirley Wong, um, our Asian Studies undergrad advisor, is a great resource to reach out as they um, she's happy to and open to answer um, any of the questions you have about Asian Studies. And we have provided her office hour, um, so please feel free to reach out during her work um, office hour through email, and if the situation gets better, um, please feel free to drop in and ask your questions. Frederick, um, just um, share his questions, um, and this question is for Aaron, Aaron W. Uh, there are resources that we can help you at UBC, like professor, to help you aim for grad school at Kyoto University or Kyoto Daikaku. Erin W, would you like to take this question? I'm sorry, uh, I lost. I... Yes, um, I'd like to take the question, but I kind of got locked out like a, like a seconds ago. So um, if the can question... you help me to uh, repeat the question? Because, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, Frederick has a question that Could, are there yeah. resources that can help you at UBC? to help you aim for grad school at Kyoto University or Tokyo Tegaku? So for grad schools, I believe you have to look into the websites, the the the, websites, the Japanese websites uh, instead, of the Jap instead of the UBC, because UBC, we have Go Global, but they provide like, you know, Go Global links. But if you're looking to grad schools, the best, the best idea is to go into their websites. I believe um, Tokyo University or Kyoto University, they have English version. So, um, and also talk to the professor about, um, see if they can help you to write a recommendation later, le letter or something like that. And uh, sometimes it's uh, also a good idea to talk to your senpais. So uh, like, let's say um, your the, the previous um, graduate, uh, uh, previous student who already graduated, but, but, but it's like they go through the process and they're now studying in those universities. Um, you can reach out to those OBs, yes. Thanks, Erin. I think she um, made a really good point. So I guess the information mm -hmm. that we were looking for about the graduate schools, they're the websites for those universities instead of the UBC one, yeah. Mm -hmm. And to Frederick, um, yeah. Aaron has made a really good point that you can always reach out to professors that indicate that you are um, applying for grad school and see if 
professors can write you a recommend uh, letter. They'll be super helpful for uh, when you are applying for grad school. So that's a really good point. We also have um, one more questions. Um, Brandon, I think um, Cindy and Aaron has answered this question. Please um, feel free to contact the advisor through email or phone call. Um, unfortunately, um, in-person drop-in is not available right now, but we will up, um, please um, keep update, updated um, from our website as we will notify you when um, the office will be reopened soon. Also, there's another question from Carmen. Um, the question is to everyone. Is co-op available for Asian Studies students? And have any of you have any co-op experiences? Does anybody want to take this question? Um, I can respond. Um, I personally don't have any, I'll preface it by saying I don't have any experience personally with co-op. But, um, but again, you there are opportunities for you to become a TA or even an RA, and a research assistant. I had, um, and that's, you know, very much like co-op. It was very applied learning. Uh, I worked at the Museum of Anthropology um, as a research assistant for Professor Timothy Brook in the Department of History and Asian Studies. So in a way, it kind of functioned like co-op where we got to, where we got to attain very practical, pragmatic, and applied ex uh, work experience and got paid to do so. Um, but as far as the co-op program itself goes, I, I am not too sure. But there are lots, but anyways, there are lots of opportunities for work uh, during your undergrad studies. Thanks, Aaron. Um, to Carmen, I think every student um, at UBC is available, is, um, is eligible for applying for co-ops um, because Asian Studies belongs to the Faculty of Arts, and we know that um, Faculty of Arts has a co-op program that any students of, um, from any art students can apply to. You. So definitely, you will have the chance to apply for co-op if you want to. I, I think um, that's all our questions for today. For today, thank you all for contribution, um, to for contributing. Um, your amazing questions and thanks our panelists for sharing their invaluable experience and providing incredible um, experience, uh, incredible use, um, learning tips for us. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Please don't forget to fill out this feedback survey that um, by clicking the hyperlink in this slide, we would like to know how we can improve in the future webinar-like events. And please stay tuned for our um, PowerPoint slides that will be sent to you. Um, if you have, also, if you haven't um, registered in this session before, please make sure you fill out this survey um, to, for us to send the slides to you. Again, a big thank you for our, to our panelists for sharing their expertise and knowledge with us. And thank you so much for joining us today, for taking the time to share um, to join in the presentation and um, ask questions. We wish everyone well. Please stay safe and healthy and enjoy the rest of the day. This now concludes today's presentation. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.